Um, I guess first I want to say thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, it is super impressive to hear what you guys are doing. I'll talk a little bit more about myself later, but I'm from tiny little Vermont um, and uh, have been trying, sometimes feeling like a lone wolf there, trying to help government uh, think differently about how it delivers technology. And so coming to a place like this and seeing how many people are engaged and how much work that you guys are doing is really inspiring. And I want to figure out how we can do this on a smaller scale in some of our more rural communities across the country. Um, but I'm here primarily tonight to talk a little bit about what we've been doing with uh, the Tech Talent Project. Um, and so I think we're working on slides a little bit, but um, what I would say, so the first couple slides, I'll preview them, I'll give you the like uh, verbal description of them. Um, just kind of lay out the problem a little bit. When you look at where we are uh, from a federal government perspective, if you just take a step back and look at the age of the systems, for example, that we're leveraging across the federal government, um, they're all in like 30 to 55 year range. So you think about health and human services, which I think is 50 years old. So that's the system that we use for Medicare and Medicaid, where it's the largest insurer in the entire country. Um, it also, you know, HHS is there to provide for some of our most vulnerable Americans. Um, and there's all sorts of policy discussions out there happening, and you see them in the, in the presidential campaign now, um, about things that we might want to do to, oh, there you go. Um, perfect. Um, to expand healthcare, for example, take Medicare for all. Well, when you look at the age of the systems we have today, Medicare plus a little more might actually break that, that piece of technology. So uh, just taking the lay of the land of where we are from a federal perspective on our systems, we have a lot of work to do across our legacy systems. Um, and I think the other thing you've seen in the last 10 years or so are some very high profile um, failures of large technology projects. Uh, what you see up here is some news stories around what happened, what's happened at the VA, around backups on appeals and things like that. Obviously, healthcare.gov was another uh, huge, huge problem from a tech perspective. Um, and so I think this, this problem is, it, it's, uh, it's increasingly on the top of people's minds. And so while all this is going on at the federal level, this is just a fun slide that kind of takes a look at the private sector and what we've seen in technology advancements over that same period of time. So things like, um, you know, turn by turn directions on phones to launching Lyft to Amazon being able to, to deliver packages by uh, drone, all of these things, you can see the, the disparity between what's happening um, at the federal level and what's happening in the private sector on tech development. And so then the question is, is, is everything fine? Is this okay? I think that I'm preaching to the choir in this room. Um, uh, the truth is that everything is not okay. Um, and that what it feels like a lot of times we're doing at the, at the federal level is saying everything's fine, we're trying to do our jobs every day, but meanwhile, the, the house is burning around us. Um, so I think in response to a lot of things of, that happened around the healthcare.gov era, the federal government actually made um, some pretty good strides in getting uh, some folks into the federal government that understand modern tech. And so uh, the first thing that happened was um, a, a, an all-out scramble to find talented people from the private sector who could come in and write the ship on healthcare.gov. And so what you see up here is a quote from Todd Park, who was one of the leaders of that effort, um, who really you know, created a whole, a whole uh, cadre of, of tech folks who left their jobs, went to the federal government, and all hands on deck approach to fixing healthcare.gov. Um, but in addition to that, there were really a few different efforts that were launched that continue to sustain themselves today. So United States Digital Service, how many folks in the room are familiar with that? I figure a lot of you would be. Um, so USCS 18F, which uh, is in the General Services Administration, it focuses on procurement um, and presidential innovation fellows. And basically all of these different organizations, they're in the federal government, but they sit slightly outside of the day-to-day -day operations of the federal government, and they bring people in for tours of service. So folks who understand modern tech, product managers, developers, things like that, in for tours of service, and they're deployed to agencies 
departments across the federal government to work on discrete, specific projects. So a team from USDS, for example, was deployed to the VA to just work on their appeal system. And they bring modern tech practices with them and they deliver a tangible piece of technology that makes people's lives better. Um, so they're really, really great efforts. Um, but I think coming out of that experience, um, the, our executive director, um, Jennifer Anastasov, who was one of the founding members of USDS, and a couple of her peers felt like, if we really want to make government work better for people at the federal level, and if we want to help it be better at delivering technology, we can't just work on the teams deployed on the ground. We need executive level leadership in the federal government that understands modern tech. Because if you have folks at executive leadership that understand this, they can create the demand for the workforce and the projects and the practices in their organizations. And so that's really what the Tech Talent Project is trying to do. Um, and there's two pieces to it. So one is we're saying agency leaders must know modern technology. And so you think about typical agency leaders, deputy secretary, um, general counsel, chief human capital officers who are in charge of hiring, key agency administrators, like who's the you know, director of Medicare and Medicaid services. These are folks that tend to be policy people um, and, uh, and might be a little bit more political, but haven't had the expectation up until now that they understand technology. Um, and the reality is that it's 2020. You can't deliver a government service or mitigate a risk or implement any of your major policy proposals without technology. And so one of the things we're trying to say is it's no longer acceptable for these the folks at these levels to, to not at least understand what good tech looks like and what good modern tech practices are. Um, and the best analogy I heard from it for it the other day is if you had a CEO of a company who was you know, testifying somewhere and said, well, I don't really know numbers. I have a chief financial officer for that. No one would think that was okay. And so same thing here. We really need to make sure that this modern uh, tech acumen is something that everybody holds across the board. Um, and then the other thing is focusing on the other leaders in agencies, like chief information officers, chief technology officers, data officers, chief information security officers, privacy officers, making sure that um, they not only understand modern tech practices, um, but they are empowered to be at the table for policy and operational conversations. So a lot of times, um, and I'll, I guess I'll talk a little bit about my background later, but in working, I saw this working in state government where the legislature or the policymakers would make a decision about a new program they want to implement and they'd say, we're going to do it in a year without really having any idea the actual technical, the technology that had to be built and the operations that had to be transformed in order to meet those deadlines. And that can have a really negative impact on the people using those programs. And so we need to make sure that um, the folks who are actually doing the tech have the right competencies and that they are at the table early and at the table often. Um, and then the other thing we're really talking about is what are the competencies of a 21st century government agency? And so um, these things, which probably a lot of folks in this room take for granted, things like uh, DevOps practices, modern stacks, product management, human-centered design, all the things that you're talking about and the work that you're doing. Um, and many of you probably know this from being in government, but this is not where most of government is at. And um, I think, again, I can speak from my experience, but um, eight years working in our health and human services programs in Vermont, it was still very wedded to big bang, waterfall, multi-year, multi-million dollar procurements for delivering technology. Um, and that's just not the way things are done anymore. So um, really getting clear on, on the suite of competencies. It doesn't mean that everybody on the team has to have all of these things, but in order to be functional, for example, at the VA, I think about if you had uh, a general counsel, a deputy secretary, a chief technology officer, and a chief data officer who together had all of these competencies, you think about the impact that you could really have on people's lives um, and the amount of demand that you could create for the, the progressive user-centered projects on the ground. Um, so the Tech Talent Project itself is focused on increasing the ability of the U.S. government to recruit modern technical leaders in order to achieve 
critical economic and policy outcomes. Um, and so I, th I see this as really a complement to a lot of the work that's being done at a bunch of other levels across the country. Um, I think about some of the, like, the work that you guys are doing on the ground. I think about the work that's being done at USDS. I think about some of the work that's being done at universities to create um, computer science curriculums that bring in humanities. All of these things um, are help are helping to move us in the right direction, um, and we need to make sure that we're bringing executive level leadership along with us. Let me go back one. Um, so there's really three things that we're focused on doing. Um, one is uh, we're publishing what we're calling the 21st Century Tech and Innovation Plum Book, which Plum Book is just some term of art. Uh, um, it's a book that's published every four years in DC of all the federally appointed positions. Um, but essentially what we're doing is identifying the top 100 federally appointed leadership level positions across the country and the competencies that are needed by people in those positions. Um, so that white paper will be out in somewhere between mid-March and mid-April, and it'll also have some case studies with some uh, challenges and opportunities that exist today in each of the federal agencies. And then once that comes out, then we're really focused on getting that information into the hands of the presidential transition team leaders who are thinking about policy and personnel. And so there the message is really simple. I've kind of already said it, but it's you can't do any of the things you want to do without technology. You need good people by your side. Um, and we're going to continue to try to drill that message forward through the election um, because it's, again, not something that uh, campaigns are almost always focused on campaign tech and not thinking about uh, what actually has to happen when they take office and take over the day-to-day -day operations of the federal government. Um, and then the third piece, which is the thing I'm really focused on, is recruiting. And it's this coast-to-coast -coast talent search of the best and brightest tech and tech-adjacent leaders out there who might consider a tour of service in one of these positions, either um, in uh, uh, January um, of 2021 or sometime down the road. Um, and really trying to think about how can we build um, and sustain a talent pipeline over time. Um, and as far as I can tell, I've never really been a part of a federal appointment cycle, but the story I get from everyone is that it's very haphazard. So election happens, there's this mad scramble to fill positions, it's my brother's cousin knows websites, and then suddenly they're <laughs> um, in charge of a multi-billion dollar federal agency. So what we want to do is uh, change that dynamic and say, how about we go out, we find really talented people who are interested in giving back. Uh, we will vet them, we will engage them, and then we will give their, that list of people to you so that you can start making calls and actually get people in that have these competencies. It's, it's a little bit of an experiment. It's not something that, that's been done before, um, but we feel like it's a really important service. There may be a, a, a long-term vision where this could be a part of something that happens within the federal government, but for now we're sort of a nonpartisan nonprofit on the outside. Um, and then, and then the question becomes, you know, say we engage people all over the country, we hand over a list of 150 people, but there's still a lot of other talented people that we've talked to that maybe the timing's not quite right or the administration isn't right. So then how do we connect those folks to what's happening at the state and the local level? Because we're having the same challenges with retaining and hiring talent in government all across the board. Um, so, uh, the other thing I'll just say is that diversity is a priority for us, and we really feel like the list that we present has to reflect the diversity of the country. Um, so, you know, my colleague Jennifer has done a lot of recruiting out in California because that's where she is. I'm in Vermont, I'm basically doing everything east of California, but um, trying to get uh, geographic diversity, gender diversity, race. Uh, political affiliation, um, it's really important that the people are in our government reflect the population of our country. So that's what, another one of our express goals. Um, so just a couple of minutes about my story and then I'll finish up and take questions. Um, so I've been involved in nonprofits and state government for my whole career. Um, I've always kind of been that do-gooder. Um, and I started as a policy person working for the state of Vermont when we stood up our health insurance exchange. 
and it went horribly. Um, and you know, we had definitely our own little healthcare.gov crisis, but we didn't have the resources that were available at the federal level to pull ourselves out of it. So as people started jumping ship, um, I just jumped in further and uh, spent a bunch of time trying to stabilize things operationally. Um, it was about as bad as any tech rollout could go with you know, staff crying every single day because people are screaming at them over the phone. I think we had um, a backlog of like 30,000 people waiting to have changes applied to their accounts. It was really horrible. <laughs> um, and so dug ourselves out of that operationally, then spent some time trying to stabilize the technology, and then took a step back from all that and said, OK, that's how we should not do technology. So how should we be doing technology? And that's when I got hooked up with um, 18F and Code for America and all of these things that I kind of felt intuitively about how we should be doing things. Then I realized, oh, there's a framework and a language for this, and there's processes and methods. Um, and I just had no idea. So I found my people. It was very exciting. Um, and then spent a couple years, um, my last two years as a political appointee, actually, in Vermont, trying to bring these practices to the state of Vermont. And um, there are some places that we, you know, we were able to do some really progressive things. And my philosophy was, you know, do user research, try to find a small problem, um, try to fix it using technology in a way that it'll actually make people's lives better, and then use that also as a vehicle to show people how different ways of working are possible. So um, my favorite example was um, uh, our eligibility determinations. If you apply for Medicaid or, or SNAP or any of those things, we require income verification from you if you don't match what's within the federal system. And at that point, everybody had to either submit something to us by mail or had to drive 35 miles to the nearest district office to drop off paperwork. So you're either missing a half a day of work um, or your paperwork is going into literally bins in closets. Um, we had 972,000 pieces of mail a year, which for Vermont, we're a very small state. There's only 650,000 of us. Um, and a third of the population is on some form of Medicaid. Um, and so this is, but this is people's personal information, right? That is obviously, um, they don't know where it is, they don't know where it's gonna be processed. Um, so we, we discovered, or we're like, that's the problem we wanna tackle. We did some work to lean our procurement processes. Um, we brought in a small vendor to do a small user-centered design contract. Um, we were able to go from a request for proposal to pilot within three months, which was unheard of for government. Um, and we, lo and behold, with the data, we, we realized like this is actually making a difference in people's lives. And it wasn't a fancy product by any means, but suddenly people could take a picture of their, of their documentation and upload it to a caseworker. Um, and so we saw things like 75% of people were doing it outside of regular business hours. Um, you know, people were, the time to determination, average time went from nine days to four days because workers were able to respond more quickly. So um, we had the data to, to back it up, but it was, people got very excited about it and they could see, okay, working in this way is differently, is possible, and it's actually making people's lives better, which helps to develop that, that trust. Um, and I think, you know, I left that work in October. Um, I will say that one of the biggest um, challenges I faced was that we didn't have the right tech leadership at the table. And so there are a lot of folks on the tech side that um, were still wedded to some of those old ways of working. And it was a slog to try to get those, change those day-to-day -day practices of working. Um, so after seven years, it was nice to take a little bit of a break and just uh, spend a little time recruiting other people to come work in government. Um, but I think the other thing is, uh, takeaway for me was that you know, government is a really complex institution and it's important to have um, realistic expectations about the rate of change. And so when I was there, I probably tried to change five or six different practices um, in ways that we worked every day. Um, things like user-centered design, user research, uh, setting up DevOps, uh, Azure DevOps and those sorts of things they will outlast me. I think people got it. They'll probably never do a project again without doing user research, which is a huge victory. I think the minute I left the room 
everything we did on agile project management and everything we did around um, smaller procurement processes went out the window. You know, because I, we didn't have enough champions to keep that work going. Um, but I think I see this as a relay race. And so the next person that comes in takes the baton and can move it a few steps forward. Um, so, you know, my closing message here <laughs> is that this, can, this is you and can continue to be you. Um, as you develop throughout your careers, there's so many different levels that you can get involved at. Um, and you know, for folks who are interested in working at the federal level, whether it's at a leadership level position, or you wanna know more about ATF or USCS or any of that, um, I'm happy to, to provide those connections because there are some really great opportunities and some really progressive things happening at the federal level. Um, and, uh, and then just keep, keep up the good work at the state and local level because it's, it's so needed there as well. One classic divide between sort of the world of civic tech and political tech is that during election years, campaigns and political organizations build up these huge and well-resourced tech organizations. And then when the election is over, a lot of those workers and a lot of the things that they built sort of get imploded and then many filter back into private industry. What's one way that you think those teams and the funding behind those teams or the momentum behind those teams could be encouraged to go into more civic roles? That's an interesting question. I think, um, look, I will just say I'm a little bit of a newbie at, at the federal level stuff, again, because most of my time has been spent at the state level um, where the circles are smaller. Um, but I, I think that's where um, really trying to focus on the transition teams. So, um, you know, uh, the folks who are thinking about what it looks like to take over um, if, if a candidate actually wins, get up and running in April and May. And there's actually funding out there for those teams to get up and running. So I think the key is getting to them and also getting to folks who communicate trusted sources to the actual candidates to help them understand why this is important. So if we can get the folks who are going to be, you know, making personnel decisions and the candidate themselves to say, oh, man, running federal government requires a lot of technology and this is a big deal and all these big policy proposals that I have can't go anywhere without tech, um, I think is, is the uphill battle. And if you can do that, then you, I, I think they might turn to their campaign staff who really did a great job on technology and try to bring them along uh, to, to the administration after the fact. So I was wondering, is it like the Peace Corps, like where you sort of just um, enroll for a specific, specific amount of time? Or is it something like you're hoping to get people in for like their whole lives and their whole careers? Um, so interesting question. So I think for any of these things like USDS, 18F, uh, presidential Innovation Fellows, they tend to be shorter time periods. On the USDS side, I think, yes? I, I, I can speak to this a little bit. Great. Like, I, I work for TPS, which, uh, which uh, uh, is the support office behind 18F and the Presidential Innovation yeah. Fellows. Um, there are a number of different tours, uh, ter terms of duty um, that are available. Um, for example, with the Presidential Innovation Fellows, um, it is a nine month to one year term. Um, and you're detailed to an agency, um, but you have to be based in DC. Um, with 18F, generally the roles you can you can you can be anywhere in the U.S. Um, and you can do two two-year terms, um, so up to four years. Although we've recently been able to start hiring people for eight-year roles and even career roles, so that is a possibility. Um, you can you can go both ways. Yeah, and I think for USDS, they try to draw people in by saying, just give us a six-month commitment. And then there's lots of people that end up staying longer because the projects are really compelling. Um, when we think about the presidential, like the appointed positions, typical length of time is 18 to 24 months. Um, but I think there's also a whole bunch of work that we need to do to bring in career staff. So folks who do want to spend their whole careers in government um, uh, that understand these same practices. I just think 
hiring into the federal government is still a pretty significant challenge. And some of these, um, like 18F and USDS, there's special permissions that they have to um, navigate the hiring process a little bit differently. Um, but uh, the traditional, like if you just go to, uh, just try to apply for a career or job in the federal government, it's tough. We need to do a lot to make it easier for people to get in. I see you in the back, but uh, I have a quick question. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you chose to focus at the federal level as opposed to state? You know, there's organizations that focus at the state level, like the Code for America uh, Fellows. Yep. Um, maybe just talk about like that choice. Yeah. Um, well, so Jennifer, uh, our executive director, who was the founding member of USCS, I think just she and her cohort worked at the federal level, and this is what they really care about. Um, and so she, she worked there, saw a problem, and wants to solve that federal problem. Um, I think for me, coming from the state uh, world, I see this problem at the state level, and I'm, I'm continually talking to Jennifer about like what could 2.0 version of this look like, and how could we do this at the state and local level as well, because the, the, it's needed all across the board. Cool, thanks. I totally love that um, we're, we're making sure the, the federal leaders at the highest level are savvy in tech and know how tech informs everything. And I'm definitely going to take that back to my village. The first response they'll have is, uh, number one, whether it's 2020, 24, 28, 32, what makes you think there will be a transition team? And then they'll also ask, you know, the federal appointees to the president, especially in federal departments, are kind of appointed just on the whim of whoever was elected, and promises have sometimes already been made before they even win the election. So how would I respond to those those responses I'm gonna get? Sure. Um, so um, on your first question, so uh, you're correct that only if the administration changes will there be an actual transition team on the ground. However, there is always a reboot. So um, in the event that the current administration mm -hmm. Uh, is reelected, there will still be a huge turnover in appointed, appointed positions. So they would do what you consider a reboot. And our perspective, um, you know, politics aside, um, <laughs> that government has to work. And the only way we're going to make sure government works is if we get talented people in government, and, and in this case, talented people who understand modern tech. So we know that there's going to be a huge round of federal appointments between January and March of 2021, and our objective is to make sure that folks get in those positions that have these competencies. Um, to your other point about like appointment appo uh, roles being promised, I'm, I know that does happen. Um, and when I look at our position list, for example, deputy secretary, going to be a lot harder to get people appointed because that's a role that typically is promised or might go to a policy person who worked on the campaign. It's a lot harder to make inroads there. I think on the tech side, there is a little bit more of a recognition that um, they don't necessarily know what the competencies are to, to, that they need to hire for. And if we do our jobs well and help explain the risk to them of not putting people in those positions that have these competencies, um, then they'll be receptive to the list. So. Unless we do that critical messaging work, um, there's, it's going to be hard to make that, that inroad. But I think it will be easier uh, on, for some of those tech roles than it is for some of the you know, general counsel and deputy secretary roles. Yeah, um, I was wondering or just kind of assuming um, that there is probably some sort of pay disparity between what people can get normally in tech versus what they can get in the government. Um, to what extent does that affect recruiting and um, what could be done about it or what do you think could be d done about that? Sure. Um, so there's definitely a pay disparity. You're not going to make uh, in federal government what you can make in the private sector, although for most of the country they're incredibly generous salaries. Um, so it's good to kind of keep that in mind. Um, and look, at the end of the day, I would say you're going to do this if you care about public service and you care about making a difference and you can make it work for your family. So there are people that we talk to that are like, no way, you can't afford me. Fine. It's probably better for everybody. But um, I'm like talking to a lot of people who have said, you know, I've always thought about how I might give back. And, and I think some of what's going on in the country right now is causing a lot of introspection in people. And people who maybe five or 10 years ago might not have 
opted for this are now really thinking about the contribution that they are making or that they want to make. Um, and so it's, you know, and a lot of these positions are in DC, so it's not just salary. It's like, hey, I want you to pick up, sell your house, move to DC for a third of your salary, and work, you know, 70 hours a week trying to do something that's really challenging. But there's a certain percentage of the people who are really excited by that challenge. And, um, and I just think there's no more rewarding work. Like, if you really want to do, tackle a complex problem, um, and have a real impact in people's lives, working in government, the scale of it is just so, is so big, the potential for impact. So, um, you know, there, there are a surprising number of people out there who uh, are interested in engaging in this discussion and, and thinking about making some big changes in their lives to make it happen. Okay. I think that's a great way to end it. Thank you so much. Give it Thank up. you very much. Got you.